hi everybody what a pleasure to welcome you to uh, this happy hour with um, Hong Jian's talk it's a true pleasure and honor to have Hong as part of the series the series is for our speakers to tell you about their living histories and so I will not take further time with the introduction and just hand it over to Hong please take it away Hong and tell us about living history Thank you. Thank you so much. And I really uh, like this idea. I didn't even know until very recent. And so thank you all for uh, putting this together. And uh, of course, to inviting me to uh, tell you a little bit. Uh, so this is a difficult subject to me because I get, uh, it's not the kind of thing I already know what to do. So I guess my career path is very stochastic, process-like. I really don't even know how to, you know, if there anything really be useful to others, but hopefully after seeing it, maybe there's some elements. But uh, in summary, I think among all the random stochastic events that happened, there's a little bit of bias, which was uh, drilled in me when I was a, had an undergraduate education in physics. That is, even though now we know there's all many different area of research, but the knowledge really should be one, should be unified. And in my own cases, I always had this desire, I think, now I look back. I want everything I learned still can be connected. Instead of I learned this three years ago, I learned this 10 years ago, they are just part of me. I want them all. And that a little bit of bias, plus, uh, huge of luck in the process of my education and research I have a sort of a mentor and a teacher pretty much shaped what I am today. So I guess the way I'm, the best way to do is just go through the linear time. And I was originally trained in physics and mathematics. And I emphasize the physics and mathematics really trying to say I actually didn't really have any good, even reasonable high school education in biology and chemistry. And that was a unique situation in a unique time, especially from China. That's the way it still is today is college education in physics and mathematics has very, very little, if any, biology and chemistry. But there's also another thing very unique for me. I don't think anybody else, um, except very few, is I started to have a conscious awareness of, on the one side of my teacher keep telling me, physicists, it's important to have something called a physical intu intuition. But it turns out I have another teacher. My mentor is my father, who is a mathematician and applied mathematician. So I start to realize it might not be as my professor told me, you know, physical intuition is not mathematics and all these things. We can talk more later, later if we have time. So he's my father. Then I went to a graduate school, abruptly showing up in the US and started to be a graduate student in biochemistry department. And I did get a proper, very hard to me to catch up to the, all the other graduate students in biochemistry and cell biology. And then much later, I appreciated there are so many people working in biology from different backgrounds but because they don't see the bigger so-called biological perspective. So that makes me feel like I'm much more close to biologists so when talking in the kind of field and that I benefited ultimately. Now in the real work I did, I was exposed to fluctuation measurement and I thank this person, my PhD advisor, Ellen Olsen, who showed me this whole biological world especially the molecular world in terms of fluctuations, measurement and data analysis. I really don't know anything about the physics as a theory then, except a rudimentary education in undergraduate. And then I started to do my first postdoc and I was so lucky. In fact, there is a twist that it wasn't my, was not my first choice. And I just, um, I went to work with Zhang Xiaoman, who is a very well-known biophysical chemist you start to see this conjugated word in my life. It's just somehow everybody has this conjugated word. And when I was with John, I ended up with spending a lot of time learning proper statistical physics. At the same time, got my hand dirty in really doing modeling 
And uh, in fact, one of the things really changed my career literally because I went to him because I still want to do experiment. And he was well known to do both experiment and theory. The very first day I met him, he told me I'm closing my lab because he was in the age of, I only start to do theory now. That literally ended my experimental bio, biophysics career. <laughs> anyway, so I got my hands dirty in doing uh, data analysis in statistical thermodynamics. And then I went to um, do a second postdoc with John Hotfield. I learned quite a few things, but to summarize, I guess what I really learned is a dynamical system view of all the biological process. In fact, he loved to say computation is a process, process is computation. So therefore it's everything. And I think that prepared me to do the next thing. That is my third, also hugely just by luck, stroke of luck. As you can see, I so far doesn't have any mathematical education. I got a faculty position in the Department of Applied Mathematics. And I started to do my own research. And the kind of differential equation based the mathematical biology become natural because the association with John. But I always want to put my fluctuation interest into it. So I ended up with doing what I start to carve out my difference in the mathematical biology as doing stochastic mathematics, using probabilities much more heavily than other people. So here's a quite a few bullet points is interesting. So I actually, first thing I want to do is actually theoretician for all single molecule biophysics, but I failed miserably. If you're interested, we have time, we can talk a little bit more. But I was lucky enough to be participated in a side project on bioengineering doing flux balance analysis, which is very popular now, but that wasn't my main research. And then the process of study single molecule lead me to really realize beyond the single molecule linear chemical kinetics. There are something called the nonlinear chemical kinetics, but it was stochastic. It ended with going to study chemical kinetics in stochastic term. And in a very practical way, many of you probably know called the SB algorithm, this kind of stuff. At the same time, of course, because influenced by Schrodinger, we are conscious of where biology in the molecule level is equilibrium most of the time, but the real biology above the cell certainly is non-equilibrium. There, we are really going after the concept of non-equilibrium steady state and entropy production. These are important characteristics of a non-equilibrium process. And I start to see a light really due to all of my past. That is somehow this whole physics about the non-equilibrium problem in connection, of course, to the classical traditional equilibrium Gibbs theory really somehow is in the mathematical theory of entropy, which is a very small, narrow area at that time by a group of mathematicians. But now we know very well. So this is the time of the end of last century. And when Jarzinski equality, all these new so-called stochastic thermodynamics come in, I came from completely different direction and suddenly realized what they're really talking about is just a stochastic theory, much more mathematical than ever, but actually already being developed by physicists a long time ago. I need to acknowledge my colleague, Jim Murray, really from him, I learned the proper, what is called mathematical biology. That led me to the second stage of my research in the last 10, 15 years. That is, I'm doing really to many people, not even mathematical biology anymore, but I really, everything in my thinking, my process is motivated by my biological processes. But literally the things I actually do, I would classify myself now as a mathematical physicist in nature, because I go follow what the mathematics tells me because nobody else can tell me what is the intuition anymore. The intuition is in biology, but they are very non-mathematical or physical. And then in the physics, we don't really have established way to think about these being open system. And here is one thing we have time and even we discuss, I really think I learned is what is the nature of called a narrative in science? You know, I think the physicists hate this word because that's just almost saying this thing is a little bit too um, sort of subjective, not, uh, wait, too objective, uh, too, wait, I mean, I have English problem. It's a little bit too object, subjective, yeah. And at the same time, we start to rethink about Gibbs theory and have a little much more further appreciation of the Gibbs, the 
really, even today in the education of statistical thermodynamics, how much depth of the Gibbs theory is still not being presented. This is all our current research. That even leads to us to rethink about where this confidence we have, this mathematically written law. Think about this. We are writing a natural law in terms of mathematics. That means the left-hand side and right-hand side has to be equal down to hundreds of digits, a thousand digits. Can you really believe that such a relation came from measurement? Anyway, so that is all I have to say. So if there's questions about different issues or, you know, these are the three things we can discuss more, which is, might be interesting on different kinds of directions. Yeah, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, thank you so much, Yong. On behalf of the audience, I am enthusiastically clapping. Um, you have set the stage for possible questions, but I will let the audience take the lead and jump in with questions. Anybody? Um, please feel free to unmute and just go for it. Uh, Rana, please go ahead. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for this uh, really uh, interesting account. Uh, my question to you is the following. Um, based on your experience, what is your advice for early career scientists, especially those who are trying something for the first time and not knowing whether they'll succeed at it or not? Well, if you started trying, you will never know whether succeed or not. But I would say, if you want to try something new, okay, so here's something, I never do something with only one reason. My default belief is whatever I'm doing or, you know, is, is useful and meaningful, hopefully. But if I want to do something new, I really need more than one reason. I never do anything for it. So I always argue myself, is really trying to do this? So now if you're going somewhere with quite a few more reasons, the first thing I would say is go find a review article. But uh, sometimes you need to find the review article after another review article, which is somehow able to connect the, your knowledge base to this new place. And in fact, I find the most difficult for a physicist training, which is really, I still believe, hold uh, as a much more a stronger version of analytics and uh, you know thinking about the world, just like John Hopkins said, it, physics is really a philosophy. I think after that, it's, it's jargon and the terminology. And, uh, and don't be scared of so much terminology, but the, as long as you are able to pass that, I think you can go into any new direction, new field. Thank you. I think my Point was kind of more directed towards graduate students who always kind of like worry about trying something new and not being certain whether uh, so they will that is, manage to succeed or not. Yeah, but the, you know, try something new. I feel like at least from my case, I I'm hard to see how do you you know you decide to try something new pretty much because of your environment. So it is hard to summarize to have a more educated way to tell other people what to try. I guess people try follow the fashion. That's one thing, even though at least I don't consider that as legitimate, but many people do that. You try after funding. That's definitely something to do a lot in the US. So even though, oh, by the way, I, I mentioned where the, I failed miserably is exactly in the sense about getting some funding what, to what I want to do. So I guess I'm the worst person to give any advice there. Um, somebody else? Go for it, Raphael. Yeah, uh, th thanks for a great talk. So uh, could you, like this relation between physical intuition and applied mathematics, right? Uh, so are there, like, could you bring some historical examples where let's say physical yeah, I, intuition great. was wrong great. So, yeah, or, I, and opposite? Example, so it's not like, wrong. No, no, like I, initially, let's say physical intuition was like incorrect and then applied mathematics sorted things out. And then opposite example, may, maybe where physical um, intuition yeah. was initially. And are they like complementing each other? Oh, definitely. So what I actually, okay, so here's my very biased opinion. After all, I'm sitting in the department of math. I think there is a better way to teach 
current delayed theoretical physics. Of course, I, I also had an undergraduate education, so I do feel like I had a little bit. The reason is, if you think back, we spend so much time struggle with mathematics, while learning quantum mechanics. We struck so much with calculus when we're learning mechanics. And I assume I never really have a proper education in general relativity, but I assume you struggle with geometry when you start learning this. I really feel the math should go a step earlier and learning it more properly as a methodology, its own logic, and then go back, think about physics. But that somehow physicists doesn't like that. And they, in fact, they're trying to argue that's not the right thing to do. And because of that, they actually, I think all the so-called physical intuition, really it just, you're completely being absorbed and worked through mathematics in the earlier stage. Think about it. If you don't understand and have a really good feel, what is a function? What is differentiation? What is calculus? Can you really call anything your intuition on mechanics? You know, your intuition on mechanics is literally just based on these very rudimentary mathematical concepts which you learned in high school. Mm -hmm. I would use the same argument in the go higher and the higher. And I'm particularly uh, now is pushing the idea of people should learn what it is the mathematician teaches about a probability theory. Because there's so many, these mathematical concepts, physicists love to learn new mathematical through what they already know of the math in another branch. That is not the complete right way to learn. You are basically using one example to learn, learning this methodology and as another example instead of learning the methodology itself. So I try to say the physical intuition really is just a earlier, another branch of applied math. It's maybe too elementary to you. You don't feel it. You start using the language, you feel so good about it. And then you call those things physical intuition in a higher level. Mm, I see. So like the probability theory is kind of one of the fields where we have the worst intuition, I think. Exactly. Yeah. You don't because we've never been taught even today. But as this mathematician already developed a lot of them. The bad thing is the mathematician has not work is spending enough time to try to water down that version, make them more intuitive, like calculus has been done in like a hundred years. Mm, I see. Thanks. Um, on that note, uh, thank you again, Hong. I'm sure these answers have seeded many questions that we can take into small group discussions, but we'll close the formal discussions here. And thank you once again for your living history talk. Thank you.